Now, I set up this conference um, basically because I read an article in the Atlantic Monthly some months ago quoting Stephen Hawking and we were hoping that he'd give a few uh, opening remarks but he's been very ill lately. Um, and Max Tegmark, who is one of our speakers this morning. And they were talking about artificial intelligence and it's moving very, very fast at the moment. Elon Musk talks about that too. Um, and they're very worried about it and yet they can't seem to stop themselves keeping going. Uh, and it's said that within about 10 or 20 years, but maybe shorter, that computers will be autonomous, that they may be able to reproduce themselves, uh, that you can't, I'm saying this, program morality or conscience into a computer, and that they're worried that computers themselves could initiate a nuclear war. When I read that, I thought, my God, as if things aren't bad enough with the United States and Russia militarily confronting each other now for the first time since the Cold War, um, computers could take over our world in that way. <clears throat> so that's why I set the conference up. And I'll just read to you uh, <clears throat> how I think, and I see the planet as a patient because I'm a physician, and clearly the planet is in the intensive care unit now, um, acutely, critically ill, whether or not the planet will survive is really difficult to ascertain, but the prognosis looks poor. So as a physician, I'm trained to assess a patient by taking a detailed medical history, then conducting a careful physical examination, which is what we will do today in the nuclear weapons area. This is followed by a series of laboratory tests which guide me to a diagnosis. Appropriate treatment then follows after the illness is diagnosed and the cause is defined, and that's what we'll be assessing today and trying to analyze. <clears throat> it is also imperative that the main disease is attended to and not concentrate on peripheral issues such as treating an unrelated complaint, like treating a boil on a patient's nose and the patient is dying of metastatic carcinoma which is really uh, significant now and appropriate, really, to what's happening in the world today. Therefore, I look at the world and its ongoing pathology from a similar perspective. There are many serious issues facing the world at the moment, but it's necessary to triage the most pertinent threats to our very survival, as it's easy to be diverted by lesser threats. Manic denial, fashions, gourmet foods and the like, and you can see this happening in New York all the time. As a physician, I would therefore say that the ever-present threat of nuclear war is an ongoing existential risk which threatens the ex extinction of almost all planetary life. This threat is even more acute because most people and politicians have become immune or are unaware of this threat or alternatively are practicing psychic numbing. That would apply at the moment to the New York Times, let me say. If there's a reporter here, take note. The truth is that Russia and America possess 94% of the 16,400 nuclear weapons in the world. The US maintains its first strike winnable nuclear war policy, and both countries have raised their nuclear arsenals to a higher state of alert because of the trouble in the Ukraine. That I've read about Putin, and if Putin has raised his weapons to a higher than normal state of alert, so has Stratcom. And Stratcom uh, raised the weapons to a high, its highest state of alert during 9-11 because no one knew what was happening. Human fallibility, mistakes. So these are the issues to be discussed. What are the factors, human and technological, that could precipitate a nuclear war between Russia and America? And how many times will we come close to nuclear war and how, how much longer will our luck hold? Two, what are the ongoing technological and financial developments taking place which are relevant to the nuclear weapons arsenals of both US and America, US and Russia? Three, what problems are associated with lateral proliferation of nuclear weapons via strenuous corporate marketing of nuclear technology? Four, what are the medical and environmental consequences of either a small or large nuclear war? Five, what are the underlying dynamics that have brought life on Earth to the brink of extinction? Six, how can we assess this situation from an anthropological perspective? Seven, what is the pathology within the present political situation that could lead us to extinction? Eight, 
How can this nuclear pathology be cured? I'd venture to say that this is probably the most important uh, conference taking place in the United States today, but as Jan Nolan said, she thinks in the world today. Um, since the Cold War ended, Amer well, just when the Cold War ended, America agreed with Russia that she would not enlarge NATO to threaten Russia. However, there's a man called Norman Augustine who was the head of Lockheed Martin, and the, the military corporations when the Cold War ended were a bit des desperate because they had no one to sell their weapons to. There was no raison d'etre to build their weapons anymore. And so Norman Augustine um, decided to visit the NATO countries, and he was supported by many, many people. I have an article here talking about the, all the corporations who were behind him. Um, and he visited the small little countries, Lithuania, Latvia, etc., and persuaded them to join NATO. Now, to join NATO, you must militarily arm yourself to the tune of several billion dollars, which was always good for Lockheed Martin et al. And they were successful. Of course, they said you can become a democracy, which is absolute rubbish. Um, look at this country, <coughs> which claims it's a democracy. And in fact, this country is a socialized country where I think over 60% of the discretionary tax dollar goes to the military industrial complex in the Pentagon. That's socialism. And the nuclear power industry is socialized too. So the main way that America spends its money is on socialism and all the little people have to put up with capitalism and fend for themselves. It's very, a very interesting dichotomy. So these countries were persuaded to join NATO and to militarily arm poor little countries. And also the EU and the IMF persuade them to tighten their belts and you saw what happened in Greece when you tighten your belts. So what's happened is NATO has enlarged right up to the border of Russia. And you can imagine how America would feel if suddenly Russia decided and announced with Canadian acceptance that Canada was now part of the Russian bloc. We saw it happen when uh, the Russians dared to put some nuclear missiles in Cuba and we were brought to the brink of extinction at that time. And I knew Robert McNamara, who was in the Oval Office, and he said to me, Helen, you don't know how close we came, to within minutes. We have come to with minutes, within minutes of nuclear annihilation quite a number of times, and that will be documented by our speakers today and tomorrow. It's interesting, and then we've got the Ukrainian situation, which um, was orchestrated by the United States. There was a coup. Yanukovych fled and Poroshenko was put in, who is an American puppet, what's new. A uh, lot of the people who are fighting on the Ukrainian side are ex-Nazis or in fact Nazis. And so Russia and America are confronting each other militarily for the first time since the Cold War ended. Nothing could be more dangerous. And what I find astonishing is that the New York Times is fostering the myth that it's all Putin's fault. The Crimea has been part of Russia since Catherine the Great. It's their only warm water port. And they had a referendum and the Crimeans wanted to stay with Russia. So the situation is grim. It reminds me of the very primitive arguments during the Cold War. When I first came to America, well, I've been there before, but in 1978, everyone said to me, almost everyone said, it's better to be dead than red. And I said, what? And he said, we don't want to be communists. And I said, well, what about the pygmies in Africa? They don't worry about that. And they said they don't want to be communists too. And I thought, this is a psychotic country, and indeed it was. So I organized with other, others, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and we held conferences throughout America describing the medical consequences of nuclear war. The first such symposium was held at Harvard, and the reporters there were absolutely perplexed. They said, what are doctors talking about nuclear war for? This is a political issue. And we said, no, it's not, it's a medical issue because nuclear war will create the final epidemic of the human race. And then the 
bishop or archbishop of Boston, cardinal, whoever, would wake up the next morning and there'd be a map of Boston with the concentric circles of vaporization and third degree burns and fires, etc. And he'd say, I don't think Jesus would approve of this. And it happened all over the country, so finally the Catholic bishops got together and wrote a pastoral letter against nuclear war. And then the Methodist bishops got together and they did a similar thing and their pastoral letter was even better than the Catholic bishops. And eventually we had a million people in Central Park in 1982 in June, the biggest rally ever in the history of America. Black lesbians from Harlem, uh, Southern Baptists, uh, Mormons, everyone was just amazing. And we had 80% of people supporting the notion that nuclear weapons um, must be eradicated, really. And, and Gorbachev then had the support, really, of the world with Reagan. Oh, they met in Reykjavik, these two men, and over a weekend they almost agreed to abolish nuclear weapons over a weekend. So therefore there's a precedent to abolish nuclear weapons, and it's time that happened. The country that's holding up the abolition of nuclear weapons is America. Without America moving, Russia won't move. If America moves unilaterally, Russia will too. We know that because they can't afford these weapons and they're very aware of what happens in war because they lost 30 million people on the Russian front in the Second World War and that's deeply embedded in their souls. I can remember as a little girl standing in the kitchen, uh, my mother said, thank God he's turned on Russia. He'll never beat Russia. But they suffered terribly and they'll never forget it. So we're in a very, very invidious position now. I've read that Putin's got his weapons on a high state of alert, as I already have said. So, and, and I'm really worried about the US Senate, now run by Hawks. John McCain's never seen a war he didn't want to get into. Why do men kill? And I think it, I'll go back and end with Einstein who said the splitting of the atom changed everything. This is not quite an accurate quote. Save man's or people's mode of thinking, thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. Nothing could be clearer now. And I'll just end by saying the Ukraine contains Chernobyl. There are many thousands of people dying of cancer now and other diseases related to Chernobyl. The Ukraine has 15 large reactors like Chernobyl. You can't have any sort of war in a country with reactors because it'll turn into a nuclear war. It's easy to melt down a reactor with a missile, very easy. So we're in a very, very tenuous position in the nuclear age. So I welcome you all here today. We've got an outstanding faculty of speakers who will address many issues that I've referred to and many others. And it's really quite exciting. And this has been live streamed, as I said, all over the world. First, I want to introduce Professor Ted Postel, Professor Emeritus of Science, Technology and National Security Policy at MIT. And he's a prominent critic of US government statements about missile defense. Please welcome Ted Postel. Is it working now? Oh, okay. Uh, thanks very much, Helen. I just want to make a quick comment about uh, what a great resource you've been over the years, and uh, uh, I really appreciate you uh, inviting me to this event, and, uh, and I think uh, you've done wonderful things to advance uh, the public understanding of these issues, and I congratulate you for it. Uh, the question that uh, I am raising today is, is whether or not the danger of an accidental nuclear war between the United States and Russia is higher today than it was at most times during the Cold War. The answer to this question is unknowable using quantitative means, but I, I believe the information we have points strongly to the conclusion that the danger of nuclear war is now considerably higher than it was um, during most of the time we, uh, we now call the Cold War. The reasons for this are both immediate and historic. If we are to be able to reduce the chances of an event that could well result in the complete destruction of the world we know, 
We need to confront and understand why we are now in the current predicament so we can begin to find ways to back away from this brink. Although I will focus here on the technical aspects of this uh, dangerous situation, the circumstances that have led to it have both political and technical dimensions. On the political side, the relationship between Russia and the United States is spiraling downward, creating tensions that are higher than at most times during the Cold War. A large part of this downward spiral is due to the unwise Russian reaction to what was certainly been a much more unwise 25-year-long period of hostile U.S. actions toward Russia. Basically, the United States has treated Russia like a defeated and reviled foe during this 25-year period, and I have many personal experiences I could share with the audience on this. Although the analogy is far from perfect, it is as if the mistakes that are widely ascribed to the Treaty of Versailles after the end of the First World War have been repeated as if there is no memory of the consequences. In addition, U.S. and Western diplomacy has um, treated legitimate concerns about the security in the area they, the Russians call the near, near Russia region or near Russia zone as if none of Russian concerns have any merit. If you disagree with this assessment, and I know a lot of people who do, partly because of the circles I move in, uh, consider how the United States would react if Russia mounted a major effort to influence the domestic politics of Panama, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Mexico by forming military alliances that were accompanied by commitments to sell arms and to provide military support to the governments of these countries. There are experts who have a far better knowledge of the political ins and outs of Russia's relationship with the West than I do, and since I am a technical expert, I want to focus on the technical problems that clearly and unambiguously greatly increase the chances of an accidental war that could lead to the U.S and Russian Central Strategic Forces becoming engaged. So this is where I will focus my uh, basic remarks. First of all, I to need to make it clear to everyone in this audience that the Russians have an extremely fragile early warning system. Unlike the United States, they have been unable to build a working space-based early warning system. They simply do not have one. The lack of a capable Russian early warning uh, system is one of the greatest dangers to the United States. You don't have to be worried about Russia. You ought to worry about the United States. Yet the U.S. government, and I have had many uh, fruitless attempts to try to get this matter addressed, has done nothing at all to think about the ways to address this problem. In fact, the U.S. government has mostly spent its effort, during, at least during the Clinton administration, now they don't even think about it, during the Clinton administration, making believe they were doing something about it, when in fact they weren't. And I have lots of proof of that. Now, the ability to see the launch of ballistic missiles from space makes it possible to have the longest war warning time of ballistic missile attack that is possible. It is a general misconception that the extra warning time provided by uh, these uh, space-based systems is the most important contribution to U.S. security that these systems provide. This is actually not the case. The most important contribution of space-based early warning systems is general information about the launch of ballistic missiles on a global scale. The only country in the world that has some capability to destroy parts of U.S. Uh, nuclear strike systems is Russia. Any attack from, uh, from Russia aimed at destroying or trying to destroy U.S. counter-strike capability would have to be executed as a massive coordinated strike. Our current space-based infrared systems would make it possible within less than a minute to know whether or not such a strike is underway. So basically it's situational awareness. Since the Russians have no space-based early warning system, they can only observe events with radars, and the Russians have worked very hard on their radar early warning system. Now, radars are limited to line of sight. Since the Earth is, is round, line of sight limits severely constrain what these radars can see. That is, the line of sight limitation does not allow them, uh, them to see events that occur below the Earth horizon. 
This was exactly the limitation that led to a false alert of the Russian early warning system in 1995. The character of that false alert made it appear that the United States might have been making a nuclear precursor attack against Russia. At the time of this potential precursor attack, there was no tension between Russia and the United States. However, because the Russians could not see over the horizon, they had to guess that what they were observing was not what it appeared to be. If such an event occurred today, especially if there were an intensified crisis over the Crimea, Ukraine, or whatever, the assessment of Russian military and political leaders that no attack was underway would be much more difficult to settle on. Making matters worse, the United States nuclear force modernization program has been doing everything possible to increase the killing power of U.S. nuclear warheads against Russian land-based ballistic missiles and command centers. One can be sure that the Russian military is closely following this U.S. technical effort. In fact, I have had direct communications with a former chief of the general staff of the Russian Strategic Rocket Forces directly confirming that there, was, that there is an active area of research and monitoring by Russian military analysts. This, of course, is absolutely of no surprise. The products of these analyses are certainly sent up to the highest levels of Russian government. In particular, Russia now has a leader who has a very substantial background in security matters. Whether or not one dislikes or admires Mr. Putin, it is undeniable that he has an extensive interest and concerns in Russia's security posture. As such, it would be the height of folly to think that he is not fully apprised of the vulnerabilities in Russia's early warning system. This should not make us feel comfortable. So we now have a situation where the political relationship has spiraled downward. The U.S. relentless preoccupation with building nuclear warfighting machines is well analyzed and understood by the Russian political leadership and the Russian early warning system is wholly inadequate for providing the kind of reliable and unambiguous data that could assure Russian political leadership that they are not under attack in certain ambiguous situations. Hence, I conclude that the chances of an accident that could lead to the launch of Russian nuclear forces is now at least as likely as it was during the Cold War. And in my view, it is probably higher than it was during most, although not all, of the time we call the Cold War. I would like to uh, finish this discussion by showing you, by changing uh, direction a bit, but, and show you how U.S. and Russian nuclear plan planners see the world relative to the actual realities. This is an important thing that all of you, I think, should understand. The U.S. is striving for greater accuracy in delivering nuclear warheads. The question a reasonable person might ask is, why? I mean, these weapons are so destructive. The first problem is that nuclear warfighters treat nuclear weapons as if they are instruments of conventional warfare that can be used in a scaled-up version of conventional wars. This conventionalization of nuclear war planning is a product of the Cold War and is still being pursued by the technical efforts within the United States and with less success, but with energy, within Russia as well. It is derived from a profoundly false belief that a nuclear war would have military objectives no dif different from that of a conventional war. In conventional warfare, each adversary tries to take advantage of confusion and chaos to isolate and destroy an enemy's forces piece by piece. By concentrating superior forces against weaker enemy forces, one can destroy the enemy forces so quickly that they cannot do nearly as much damage in return. So you really want to isolate the force and just chomp them up. Now, in order to achieve this goal, when fighting an adversary who is roughly the same size and capability, military planners try to find ways to concentrate their forces so that, so that they can locally have numerical and firepower superiority. In order to do this, it is critical to be able to disrupt or destroy an enemy's command structure, communications, and mobility. 
This is generally achieved by attacking command and control nodes, bridges, railroads, railheads, and the like. If this goal is achieved, it is then possible for a skillfully commanded military force to take advantage of the chaos and disorder so as to crush an equally capable enemy force by destroying it piece by piece. Could I have uh, the first slide, please? Can you turn on the slides? Oh, they're there. Okay, let me show you uh, what the uh, Russian nuclear warfighting plan might look like, which is simply a mirror of U.S. nuclear war plans. Uh, this is, um, yeah, I guess I should. This is, um, yeah. <laughs> um, this is a notional plan. This is by no means uh, uh, in, uh, in real, although it, it could be certainly real and worse. What the uh, planner would do is the planner has these targets they want to destroy. Bear in mind, they're thinking of these weapons like they are conventional instruments of conventional war. The particular targets can be very hard, hard to blast if you're talking about destroying them physically in terms of just breaking them up into pieces. That may not, that may be, you may not need to do that, but that's what the planners think in terms of. So for example, if you have some port facilities here, you might put a nuclear weapon on this port facility because docks, dock facilities require tremendous amounts of overpressure, blast pressure, uh, to destroy them. Uh, you might have a command center under the World Trade Center. You see that little circle there shows the, the, the lethal range from the point of view of the um, war planner because this shelter is underneath the, uh, the, 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 the trade center and you need to bring tremendous amounts of blast to collapse the internal structure. I'm not saying this is realistic, I'm just telling you. And then you have all these bridges. The bridges, of course, are points where mobility would allow your enemy to move forces in some kind of fictitious uh, conventional war. You might have a, a, a railhead, for example, at the Grand Central Station. You might have a political leadership target at Gracie Manor, and, and so on. So you could have uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of uh, uh, targets that uh, you could uh, well um, find uh, you need to service, in the words of uh, the way the nuclear planners think, uh, relative to um, um, the situation we actually face. All right, now, within uh, the mythology of nuclear warfighting, the elimination of these targets would reduce the enemy's ability to move equipment, communicate, coordinate, so you can basically eliminate their, their ability to fight back. So, the net result is that many additional warheads are needed to be targeted for redundancy, since some of the number of warheads can be expected to fail during flight. And all in all, it is easy to see how a large number of warheads could be needed. Basically, you need to destroy these warheads, th these targets. They're very hard. And also, you need to assure that they're destroyed, which means you have to have redundancy. To give you a concrete example that's anchored in history, Hiroshima was destroyed by a single nuclear weapon that had a yield of roughly 12 and a half, and a half kilotons. In 1960, George Kistiakowsky, who was then a uh, science advisor to President Eisenhower, went out to Strategic Air Command and looked at what they were doing. And one of the things he did was he asked for information about how the U.S. was targeting a Russian city that was about the size of Hiroshima, just to get, a, to get an example. And um, at that time, the nuclear war plans called for a single four and a half megaton bomb, followed by three 1.1 megaton bombs for the attack on this Hiroshima-sized city. So to put this in perspective, they committed 7,500 kilotons to an attack on a city that had been destroyed only 15 years earlier by 12 and a half kiloton weapon. So now that's where the idea of overkill begins to make sense. Now part of the rationale for all the extra ordnance was to gain assuredness that the target would be hit by at least several of these nuclear weapons. Another part of the rationale was to assure that each of the individual targets of interest within the city were adequately damaged. Damage is, having a high damage level 
is, uh, is an extremely important part of uh, nuclear war planning psychology. So uh, this leads to these very large numbers. The, um, in order to get a sense of the reality of the situation, uh, I have, um, let's see if I've got this right, okay. I have just uh, put together a diagram. You'll see this probably, I think uh, Stephen will show the same one. I chose an 800 kiloton warhead because Stephen uh, Starr wisely chose uh, a warhead that is standard in the uh, Russian arsenal. And basically the scale is, uh, this is basically about, about a mile. Notice here these lines. These lines show you the accuracy. The upper line shows you the accuracy that's currently achievable with U.S. submarine launch ballistic missiles. It's about 600 feet, uh, a circle of diameter, about 600 feet. They are working very hard to get down to a circle of about 400 feet with the nuclear modernization program. So um, to give you a sense of the, the actual physical effects, this shows you the fireball from uh, a nuclear explosion of 800 kilotons over this area. Now down here I've just shown uh, a white uh, sort of semi uh, uh, semi-transparent cloud to emphasize that the light and heat coming out of this fireball is uh, tremendously large. It's about two and a half, three times the um, light and heat uh, coming out of the, the equivalent surface of the sun. And of course the sun heats the earth from 90 million miles pretty effectively and of course this thing is very close. So, so what happens is the light and heat is so intense that stone surfaces literally will shatter from the heating rate. I mean, they'll just thermally disintegrate. And uh, not necessarily burn, but thermally disintegrate. And, you know, metal will melt or evaporate. Roads will melt or evaporate. It'll be extremely intense. And, of course, you wouldn't be able to see through, uh, through this haze. It's just there for... Now, I keep always pointing the wrong way my story of my life. Um, here is just a depiction of what happens 30 or 40 seconds later. And um, the fireball is still, hasn't begun to rise very, it'll buoyantly rise to a, a tremendous height. And what happens is it acts, the fireball acts like a fast moving piston. It's just superheated air from the deposition of energy from the exploding nuclear weapon. It acts like a fast moving piston on the surrounding air. Develop, causing a shock wave that reaches the ground and then is reflected from the ground. So you have a reflected and primary shock. You have a pressure wave of enormous intensity and physical length, physical uh, width. And you have very high winds and you see all this debris being lifted up along with it. And eventually, a very counterintuitive thing happens. Uh, eventually the fireball w will uh, rise buoyantly to an altitude of maybe five miles, and you can have 200 or 300 mile an hour winds internal just from the sucking action of this rising fireball. That's one nuclear weapon. Um, okay, um, two minutes, just in time. And I don't mess with the... Uh... All right, so um, let me bring you back to the first slide. Uh, what that shows is the objectives of the uh, nuclear force modernization program. Let's go back to it. The force modernization program is almost solely aimed at making it more difficult and more feasible for the war fighters to execute their imagined attack plan against New York City. If this has the appearance of being completely insane and disconnected from any plausible reality, I've achieved my goal here today. The fact of the matter is that it is completely impossible to fight and win a nuclear war because the effects of nuclear weapons are so large and so indiscriminate that the only possible outcome of any strategy would be indistinguishable from attacks aimed at killing as many people as possible. Doesn't matter what your strategy is. If you use these things, that's the outcome. Yet US uh, nuclear war planning treats this totally fraudulent theory of war as if it is a goal of US forces. So this brings us back to the question of deterrence. And I'll end here. 
If the only realistic hope of deterring potential adversaries is by threatening them with physical and socially mortal consequences of reprisal, then although this option may be extremely uncomfortable for many of us, it is all that we have. It's just, that's what it boils down to. Striving to be able to do more only creates the appearance that you think you can fight and win a war against a potential adversary. In this case, we're talking about Russia. The net result is the Russians have no choice but to wonder what the United States might do in a crisis. The Russians have a substantial fraction of vulnerable nuclear forces, and they do not have the early warning capability to assure themselves that these forces are not being attacked. This is not a situation that should make anybody in this room comfortable. It increases the chance that a horror beyond existential experience could result from simple human error. The idea that by continuing to raise the level of threat against Russia via the kinds of improvements that are now being implemented in the US nuclear force modernization program might well be counted as possibly the most dangerous insanity in human history. Thanks very much. And I'm in time. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. You, you got to say, Brooke. Thank you, Ted. <clears throat> the next speaker is Max Tegmark, who, as I mentioned earlier, was mentioned in the Atlantic Monthly piece along with. Uh, Stephen Hawking. Max Tegmark has been concerned about nuclear war risk since his teens and started publishing articles about it at the age of 20. He is president of the Future of Life Institute, which aims to prevent human extinction, as discussed in his popular book, Our Mathematical Universe. His scientific interests also include precision, cosmology, and the ultimate nature of reality. He is an MIT physics professor with more than 200 technical papers and has featured in dozens of science documentaries. His work with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey on galaxy clustering shared the first prize in Science Magazine's breakthrough of the year 2003. His title is Artificial Intelligence and the Risk of Accidental Nuclear War. Max Sigmark. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. Can I borrow the clicker? Well, it seems like you've invited a lot of people from MIT this morning. <laughs> yep. So, as you heard, I am a physicist, a cosmologist. I spend much of my time studying our universe trying to figure out what's out there, how old it is, how big it is, how it got here. Now I want to share with you my cosmic perspective. You heard from Theodor Postol here that what we've done with nuclear weapons is probably the dumbest thing we've ever done here on Earth. I'm going to argue that it might also be the dumbest thing ever done in our universe. When we look at it from a cosmic perspective, here we are, 13.8 billion years after our Big Bang. Something quite remarkable has happened. Life has evolved. Our universe has become aware of itself. This life has done a lot of really fantastic things that are truly inspiring. We have created great music, theater, literature, and by using our curious minds, we've been able to figure out more and more about our cosmos how enormously vast it is, how grand it is, how beautiful it is. And through this understanding, we've also come to discover technologies that enable us to take more control and actually start to shape our cosmos, giving us the opportunity to make life flourish far beyond what our ancestors had dreamt of. So we've done a lot of very inspiring things. But we've also done some dumb things, and even some extremely dumb things here in our universe. And uh, one of the bad habits I have as a professor I like to give is I like to give grades, sometimes unsolicited. So I thought, what grade should I give for humanity for risk management one, 
101 here, 13.8 billion years in. And I figured, well, you know, I asked some friends, they said maybe a B plus. You know, we've done a lot of dumb stuff, a lot of close calls like the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we're still here, so maybe a B plus. But from a cosmic perspective, actually, I really have to give a D minus, even though as Theodore can, can, can certify, that's not an allowed grade at MIT. D is the lowest above F there is. Why a D minus? Well, because from the standard perspective, you know, a lot of people feel that humans are the pinnacle evolution of evolution, where this is what we got, this planet, we're limited to it, and people are very obsessed about the next 50 years, maybe the, the next election cycle even, right? So if we wipe ourselves out in 50 years, maybe it's not such a big deal. From a cosmic perspective, that is completely retarded. Uh, we haven't seen, we, we ain't seen nothing yet. It would be completely naive in a cosmic perspective to think this is the best, this is as good as it could possibly get. We have 10 to the power of 50 si 57 times more volume at our disposal for life out there. We don't have 50 years, we have billions and billions of years available. We have an incredible future opportunity that we stand to squander if we go extinct or, or in other ways to screw up. People argue passionately about what the probability is that we wipe out in any given year. Some might say it's 1%, some might say, oh, it's much lower, a, a percent of a percent, some might say it's higher, 10%. Any of these numbers are just completely pathetic. If, if it's 1%, you expect maybe we'll last for 100 years. That's pretty far from the billions of years of potential we have there, right? So, come on, let's be a little more ambitious here. And let me just summarize in one single slide why I think it's so pathetic how reckless we are being stewards of, our, of, of life. Namely this slide. Which one of these two people is more famous? Let me ask you one more question. Which one of these two people should we thank for us all being alive here today? Because he single-handedly perhaps stopped or prevented a Soviet nuclear attack during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's one clue, it wasn't Canadian. You know. <laughs> so these are some pretty screwed up priorities we have as a species. Now, when I, was, uh, when I first became aware of this nuclear situation, uh, when I was about 14, I was, I was really quite shocked by how, how so many grown-ups could be so dumb. And um, when I was 17, I, I uh, felt I wanted to do whatever little things I can do for this. I, went and I, I was in Stockholm, Sweden. I went and volunteered to write some articles for a, a local magazine. I, I wrote a bunch of articles about nuclear weapons and nuclear war and so on. And the f f oldest article ever, to my knowledge, about the U.S. hydrogen bomb prob project, which from, from my physicist point of view, <coughs> when it started getting incredibly scary, is this one from 1954, which, using, which um, to my knowledge, for the first time really lays out what had largely been um, unknown to the broader public, the fact that America had just do done its fourth hydrogen bomb test and that there had actually been three or ones before that. As you see here, that, um, this explosion here had lifted the uranium curtain and a lot of things which had been done very much behind the back of the American people and even a lot of politicians actually seemed kind of reckless that the fourth blast here was five times more powerful than, than had been anticipated. A lot of Japanese fishermen got radiation poisoning for being in the area, etc., etc. Now, this article was translated into French by Jean-Paul Sartre. It was actually read into the congressional record by an American politician who gave no attribution whatsoever to where he had gotten this article. And nobody know, knew, actually, still nobody really knows publicly who wrote this article, because Jules Laurent doesn't exist. This was written by someone who was so worried about getting in trouble with the McCarthy folks during the time that he, he wrote this under a false name. So I figured in honor of, of this meeting, I would tell you who wrote this. You'll be the first to know. It was my father, Harold Shapiro, wrote this article. <laughs> And if anyone wants it, I can email you a copy. Now, coming back to the cosmic perspective, 
just to emphasize how stupid I feel we're being as a life form, uh, I mean, just, just tell you the way I see this, just in car simple cartoon form. Here we are on this planet, and we humans have decided to build this device. Let's cartoon fashion draw it like this, okay? It's called the Spectacular Thermonuclear Unpredictable Population Incineration Device. Okay, I'm a little bit inspired by, my, by Dr. Seuss here, I have to confess. Okay. For, this is a long mouthful, so let's just abbreviate it. S-T-U-P-I-D. Okay? This device, it's a very complicated device. It's a bit like a Rube Goldberg machine inside, a very elaborate system. Nobody, there's not a single person on the planet who actually understands how 100% of it works. Okay? But we do know some things about it. It has two knobs on the front, X and P, which I'll explain to you shortly. And it was so complicated to build that it really took the talent and resources from more than one country. They worked really hard on it for, for many, many years. And not just on the technical side, you know, to invent the technology, to be able to create what this device does, namely massive explosions around the planet, but also to overcome a lot of human inhibitions towards doing justice. So this, this system actually involves also a lot of very clever social engineering where you put people in special uniforms and have a lot of peer pressure and you use all the latest social coercion technology to make people do things they otherwise normally wouldn't do. Okay? And you do fake tests and then people who fail to launch the missiles, you fire them, replace them and, and so on. A lot of clever thought has gone into building stupid. All right? Now, that's what this device does. and. Um, it's kind of remarkable that uh, we went ahead and put so much effort into building it since actually really there's almost nobody on this spinning ball in space who really wants it to ever get used, to ever wants the stuff to blow up. But we'll continue talking throughout the conference about why we humans decided, made it anyway. Let's focus now instead a bit on how it works. What are these two knobs? The X knob determines the total explosive power that this thing brings to bear. And the P knob, it determines the probability that this thing will just boom, go off in any random year for whatever reason. As we'll see, one of the cool features of it is that it can spontaneously go off even if nobody actually wants it to. All right? So you can tune these two knobs, X and P. Let's look a little bit at uh, how this has evolved over time, the, the settings of these dials. Of course, in 1945, I feel personally guilty about this being a physics professor because the knob was set to zero until we physicists came on the scene and figured out how to ramp up X here. Um, this is a plot of how the number of warheads have, has evolved over time. You guys are all quite familiar with this. Of course, it's not just that the number of warheads has changed. We started out you know, below 20 kilotons with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And by the time we were up to Tsar Bomba, we were up to 50 megatons, you know, 3,000 times more powerful. Uh, we peaked in the total in the setting of the X knob around the mid 80s with six, about 63,000 uh, warheads. Since then, the total number of warheads, as you know, has gone down quite a bit, but sadly the drop has stopped and things haven't gone down much at all in the last decade. This is roughly where we stand today, about 16,000 hydrogen bombs, about 4,100 of them on hair trigger alert, meaning they can be launched on you know, five to 15 minutes uh, notice, okay? So a lot of my friends, unfortunately, take the mere fact that this has gone down this curve as a reason to stop worrying about this, which I think is a very bad idea. Now that we have much better climate modeling, this is a paper I really like by uh, Robok et al. Uh, and when I made this talk and I put in this, uh, this graph, <laughs> I had absolutely no idea that the speaker after me is in fact Robok, so I'm very honored. <laughs> So I did not put this in, you know, to make you feel good. I put it in because it's a fantastic piece of work. What you're seeing here, and we'll hear much more about it, of course, in the next talk, is simply the average surface temperature change during the two years after a, new, a global nuclear war with roughly today's arsenals. And, and it's in Celsius. So you can see you typically drop the temperature by about 20 Celsius throughout most of the American uh, breadbasket here in some parts in the Soviet farming areas, it drops by 35 Celsius, so 70 degrees Fahrenheit. What does that mean in plain English? Well, you know, it doesn't, you don't have, 
to think very hard. You don't have to have a great imagination to imagine that if you turn this cornfield into this, you know, might have some impact on the world food, world food supply. And, and you don't have to be very creative either to imagine that if you have total infrastructure collapse and mass starvation, there are going to be a lot of other things which are really hard for us to predict. But we certainly can't rule out pandemics on a scale we haven't seen since the Great Plague. And moreover, having just massive amounts of, of um, handguns and things around, you know, the, whoever survives and will have obviously armed gangs going from house to house doing enormous damage to whatever survivors there are. It's clearly not a situation we would like to put ourselves in. So taking the setting of this X knob as so low now that we should stop worrying would be ultimate naivete in my opinion. Let's talk about the other knob, P. The probability that this thing just goes kaboom for whatever reason. My own view is that the most likely way we'll get a nuclear war going is, through, is by accident, which can also include people through various sorts of misunderstandings. We know for sure, we don't know what P is, obviously. There's good debate about it. We should discuss it here at the meeting. But we've, we, can, we know very rigorously it's not zero because as you, you, so many of you are very well aware, there have been enormous numbers of close calls caused by all sorts of things, computer malfunction, power failure, faulty intel, navigational error, a crashing bomber, an exploding satellite, etc. And in fact, if it weren't for very heroic acts of certain people, we'll talk more about Vasily Arkhipov, for example, and Stanislav Petrov, who might already have had a global nuclear war. So P is not zero. What about the change of P over time? We talked about how X has changed. How has P changed? Well, we heard a very powerful argument here from Theodor Postol that even though P certainly dropped after 1990, when the US and Russia decided to chill out quite a bit, it might very well have gone up quite a bit again. And uh, there are various reasons for this. Obviously, increasing US-Russia mistrust is a very bad thing, and that's certainly happening now. Then there are a lot of just random dumb things that we do which increase P. Uh, just one little example among many that's been discussed is this plan to replace two out of the 24 submarine launched ballistic missiles on the Trident by conventional warheads that you can fire at North Korea. You know, a great setup for misunderstanding. Since if you're, the, so if you're the Russians and you see this missile coming, you have absolutely no way of knowing what kind of warheads it has. Uh, let me and spend my last five minutes talking about the impact of technology on P. The impact of technology on the risk of accidental nuclear war. A lot of the dumb things have been caused by just people and social things, but technology obviously has a powerful effect on these things. We heard from Theodore Postel already various examples of how technology is perhaps increasing the risk of accidental nuclear war. Mutual assured destruction worked great when missiles were accurate enough to destroy a city, but not accurate enough to destroy a silo. That made it very disadvantageous to do any kind of first strike. Now we're seeing, thanks to early forms of artificial intelligence that have really enabled very precise targeting of missiles, you can hit very, very accurately. That's better for a first strike. Having submarine launched ballistic missiles very close to their targets also is good for a first strike. You get less time for the enemy to react. And these very short flight times and also the better ability for, to track where the enemy submarines are and take them out means a lot of people are a lot jumpier. There's very short times to decide. So both the US and the Soviet Union, and Russia, of course, are on hair trigger alert, launch on warning, where decisions, you have only five to 15 minutes to decide. Obviously, to that, so things like this can increase P. What about artificial intelligence? We heard from Helen how there's a broad consensus that artificial intelligence is progressing very rapidly. In fact, I spent a, I've spent a lot of time, in fact, I just came back last month from a conference in Puerto Rico that my wife over there and I and my, many of my colleagues organized where we brought together the, many of the top AI builders in the world to discuss the future of AI. And a lot of people felt that things that they thought were going to take 20 years to happen five years ago have already happened. There's huge progress. Obviously, it's very hard to forecast what will happen 
looking decades ahead if we get human level AI or beyond, but we can say some things about what's going to happen much sooner and what's already happening as computers get more powerful and have more and more impact on the world. For example, for example, if you can make computer systems that are more reliable than people in, in properly following proper protocol, it's, it's an almost irresistible temptation for the military to implement them. We've already seen a lot of the communications and command and even analysis being computerized in the military. Now, properly following proper protocol might sound like a pretty good thing until you read of the Stanislav Petrov incident. Why was it in 1983, when he got this alarm that the U.S. was attacking the Soviet Union, that he decided not to pass this along to his superiors. Well, he, he decided to not follow proper protocol. He was a person. If he had been a computer, he would have followed proper protocol, and maybe something much worse would have happened. Another thing with, with this, which is disturbing about computerizing things more and more is that we know that the more you depersonalize decisions, the more you use, you take system one, as Kahneman would say, out of the loop, the more likely we are to do dumb things. If, if President Obama had a person with him who he was friends with, who carried the nuclear launch codes surgically implanted next to her heart, and the only way for him to get them was to stab her to death first, right? That would actually make him think twice before starting a nuclear war, and it might be a good thing, right? And if you we, take that away, if you, all you need to do is press a button, less inhibitions, if you or if you have a super advanced artificial intelligence system that you just delegate the decision to, it's even easier because you're not actually authorizing launch, right? You're just delegating the authority to the system that if, if something happens in the future, then please go ahead and properly follow a proper protocol, right? That worries me. Then there is bugs, right? Raise your hand if you've ever been given the blue screen of death from your computer. Okay, well, let's hope the blue screen of death never turns into the red sky of death. Right? This is funny if it's just two hours of your presentation that got destroyed, but it's not so funny if it's your planet. And uh, finally, I think another thing which is happening as artificial intelligence systems get more and more advanced is they become more and more inscrutable black boxes where we just don't understand what reasoning they use, but we still trust them. You know, I'm driving with my GPS. I was just last week. We were up in New Hampshire with the kids, and the, my, my GPS said, turn left. On, on Rufus Colby Road, and we, we drive down there, and then suddenly there's this enormous snow bank blocking the road, done, you know. I have no idea how it came to that conclusion, but I trusted it. If we have a, a super advanced computer system which is telling all the Soviet, or all the Russian military leadership, and Putin, that yes, there is an American missile attack happening right now, here's the cool map, high-res graphic, they might just trust it, without knowing how it came to the conclusion. If it's a human, you can ask the human, how did you come to this conclusion? You can challenge them, you can speak the same language. It's much harder these days to query a computer and clear up misunderstandings. So there are, I don't, I'm not standing here saying we know for sure that AI is going to increase the risk of accidental nuclear war, but we certainly can't say it won't, and it's very likely that it'll have strong effects. This is something we need to think about. It would be naive to think that the, the rise of, the, of artificial intelligence is going to have no impact on the nuclear situation. Let me conclude by just coming back to the cosmic perspective again. It's easy when you look up and to our cosmos and see how big it is to feel small and insignificant. In fact, I started feeling more and more insignificant the more I learned about the size of the, of the cosmos in my scientific career until I had a total U-turn. Because we have discovered that yes, first of all, there are way more planets than we thought there were. But we've also discovered that it seems like life advanced enough to build telescopes and technology like we have is much more rare than you might have thought. In fact, we haven't found any evidence at all so far that there is any anywhere in our observable universe besides us. We don't know which way it is. I argue in my book that we are probably the only life within this region of space that we have access to that's come this far, which makes give us, if it's true, a huge responsibility. You know, why are all these galaxies beautiful? It's because you see them. That's why they're beautiful. If, if we annihilate life and there's no consciousness with telescopes, they are not beautiful anymore. They're just a giant waste of space. So what I'm saying here is that rather than look to our universe to give meaning to us, it's we who are giving meaning to our universe. And uh, 
we should really be good stewards of this. Because of this, as Helen Caldicott mentioned, I was part of, I'm the president of the Future of Life Institute, we founded to really try to focus humanity on, on being better stewards of this incredible opportunity we have. Of course, we all love technology. Every way in which 2015 is better than the Stone Age is because of technology, but it's absolutely crucial that we, um, before we just go ahead and develop technologies to be powerful, also develop the wisdom to handle that technology well. Nuclear technology is the first technology powerful enough that it's really, really driven this home. Artificial intelligence is another example of this. We, with our organization, have so far spent most of our effort on uh, things to do with AI, but we care deeply about nuclear issues as well. And I, I, we have a lot of awesome people in our organization, and we're very eager to hear from you ideas for how we can help make the future of uh, life actually exist and how we can actually help all of your efforts to keep the world and keep ourselves safe from nuclear weapons. Thank you. He did just what the doctor called for. <laughs> um, okay, the next speaker is Alan Robock, Distinguished Professor of Climate Science in the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers University. Professor Robock has published more than 350 articles on his research in the area of climate change, including more than 200 peer-reviewed papers. His areas of expertise include geoengineering, climatic effects of nuclear war, effects of volcanic eruptions on climate, regional atmosphere hydrology mo modeling, and soil moisture variations. He serves as editor of Reviews of Geophysics, the most highly cited journal in the earth sciences. His honors include being a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the American Meteorological Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and recipient of the AMS Jewel Charney Award. Professor Robock is a lead author of the 2013 Working Group First Fifth Assessment Report, One Fifth Assessment Report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was awarded the Nobel P Peace Prize in 2007. His title is Nuclear Famine and Nuclear Winter, Climatic Effects of Nuclear War, Catastrophic Threats to the Global Food Supply. Alan Robock. Thanks very much, Helen, for inviting me here. And so this work was done in collaboration with a number of other people, uh, in particularly, most recently, Michael Mills and Brian Toon and Lily Shaw. So here's our beautiful planet. But after, uh, stretched somehow by the computer here, uh, after a nuclear war, it might look like this, with a cloud of smoke covering the, the Earth, blocking out the sun, and making it cold and dark at the Earth's surface. And the, uh, what could cause this, uh, Ted showed you what a blast over New York City would, would do, but he didn't show the next step, which is the fires that would result and put smoke in the atmosphere. There are two types of targets, ground bursts, uh, and so the cities would burn and firestorms would build. Closer? Okay. Is that better? Then I can't see the screen. <laughs> okay. Ground bursts also produce dust, and in one case the sunlight gets absorbed, in another case it gets reflected. But that means very little sunlight would reach the ground. And that would cause rapid large drops in surface temperature. Uh, this would be devastation to agriculture and natural ecosystems. The smoke in the atmosphere also heats the upper atmosphere, which then destroys ozone. And that would mean a lot more ultraviolet radiation reaching the ground, also which would be devastating for life. 
So this produces what we call nuclear winter with cold, dry, dark conditions at the surface, more ultraviolet, producing crops dying and global famine. Now, uh, Max just showed a version of this uh, graph showing the total number of nuclear warheads. The first idea of this was uh, by a paper by Paul Crutzen and John Burks, and then climate model simulations of the response were done by both Russians, Alexander F. Stenchikov, and Americans, Turco et al. And I published a paper the next year showing the long-term effects. And the nuclear freeze movement was going on at the same time as Helen described. And then the nuclear arms race ended. And this science was part of the story of why the nuclear arms race ended. The Soviet Union ended five years later, so it wasn't the end of the Soviet Union that ended the arms race. I'd also like to point out that the number by 2017 is not zero. Uh, we still will have 5,000 nuclear weapons on the planet, and that's still enough to produce nuclear winter. So the problem has not been solved. Why do I think we scientists had a role? Well, you can ask the people that made the decision, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. Reagan said, a great many reputable scientists are telling us such a war could end up in no victory for anyone because we'd wipe out Earth as we know it. If you think back to natural calamities back in the last century, in the 1800s, volcanoes, we saw the weather so changed there was snow in July in many temperate countries. And they call it the year in which there was no summer. Now, if one volcano can do that, what are we talking about with the whole nuclear exchange, the nuclear winter that scientists are talking about? It's possible. And Gorbachev said models made by American, Russian and American scientists showed a nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter that could be extremely destructive to all life on Earth. The knowledge of that was a great stimulus to us. So both these men who made the decision had this information from both Russian and American scientists telling them the same story. That was a powerful uh, message. And in the United States, people said, oh, why do we care about climate effects? We're all going to die anyway from a nuclear war. Wait, we're all going to die. <laughs> and uh, it made people really focus on the direct effects, too, and the craziness of the increase of the nuclear weapons. So that was 30 years ago. Why am I even telling you about it? I want to ask two questions. The Cold War and the arms race are over. Could the remaining nuclear arsenal still produce nuclear winter with temperatures below freezing? And now there are not just two nuclear nations, there are nine. What if a couple of the new nuclear nations, say India and Pakistan, had a war on the other side of the world? How would that affect us? So the answers to these questions are, yes, the current arsenal can still produce a nuclear winter. And it will last much longer than we thought, decades. And a small nuclear war would not produce winter, that is, the temperatures wouldn't get below freezing, but it would be terrible direct effects, and there would be severe impacts on global agriculture for more than a decade. Now, unfortunately, we know that cities can burn. There was an earthquake in San Francisco in 1906, and Jack London was out on San Francisco Bay. He wrote, within an hour after the earthquake, the shock of the smoke of San Francisco's burning was a lurid tower visible 100 miles away. And for three days and nights, this lurid tower swayed in the sky, reddening the sun, darkening the day, and filling the land with smoke. And it produced a firestorm and pumped the smoke up into the upper atmosphere. This is what San Francisco looked like afterwards. All the buildings were gone except for some of the stone ones. This is what one of the survivors of Hiroshima remembers, which is the smoke and the fires. And this is what Hiroshima looked like afterwards. So we have this example of cities burning and producing smoke. The number of nuclear weapons, ha countries with nuclear weapons, has increased about one every five years until the Soviet Union broke up. And now we have two more since then. And now we have nine nuclear nations. Uh, Max showed another table like this. There are about 16,400 nuclear weapons in the world now, as of August 2014. So the graphs show the different, uh, the yellow are the ballistic missiles, which are in hair trigger alert. Russia has about 8,000, the U.S. about 7,000. All these other countries have a couple hundred. Why did they stop? Why did they only have a couple hundred? How many nuclear weapons do you have to put on your enemy to deter them from attacking you? One, okay, maybe two if the first one doesn't work. So why do we still have thousands? I mean, the U.S. and Russia could immediately get, go down to 200 each 
and not lose any of their de deterrent ability, even, even if it were a deterrent. Now, Max talked about, Ted also, about how close we've come several times. What about this time? Imagine you're Pakistani air defense and you see an attack coming in over the horizon. Who do you, and you're a nuclear nation. Who do you think, who do you think was, uh, would be attacking you? Would you guess it was the United States? Or maybe you'd think it was India. So we, did we almost start a nuclear war by going to get Osama bin Laden? We didn't, fortunately. But along the Kashmiri border, there are always disputes between Indians and Pakistanis. Imagine a skirmish there escalating due to poor communication, misunderstanding, panic, problem with the computer. In fact, the last year I was at the IPPNW meeting in Kazakhstan, and I picked up the newspaper that morning in the, in the hotel. Four people were killed when nuclear-armed rivals India and Pakistan traded heavy fire across the border early, border early Saturday. This happens all the time. What's gonna, uh, we've been really lucky that this, again, hasn't escalated into something worse. So we decided to look at what the climatic effects of such a war would be. So we took 50 Hiroshima-sized weapons and put them on the 50 targets in each country that produced the largest amount of smoke. And for India, this would produce uh, three and a half million tons of smoke. For Pakistan, three million, six and a half million. We said, let's be conservative. Let's put five million tons of smoke into the upper atmosphere and see what the climate r response would be. This is much less than 1% of our, even our current global nuclear arsenal, 0.03%. And of, uh, of course, it would be a terrible direct effect. 20 million people would die directly. So here's a, a movie of where the smoke would go. And the, it, with, it would be heated. The, this is the tropopause. So most of it would be heated and go up into the stratosphere, the region above where there's weather. So there wouldn't be any rain to wash it out. And it would last for more than a decade. And it would cover the whole world. If you graph the climate response on a graph of global average temperature, this is the blue is the global warming I all, we all know and love, which I spent a lot of time working on. The red would be the global temperature change. So it would be a de couple degrees colder. It wouldn't be winter temperatures. But this would be the climate change unprecedented in recorded human history, colder than the Little Ice Age. Now, two other climate models have recently done a similar calculation to make sure this is not dependent on one climate model. All three found basically the same result. This is the climate model at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is a much more detailed and also includes the effects of ozone. And so the smoke goes up. It gets heated and goes up into the upper stratosphere. And it stays there for, for years, and, and the sun heats it. And as you, th this is in April. As you get to the northern hemisphere summer, it, it, it goes to the northern hemisphere, but heated by the sun. And then it, and then it goes into the southern hemisphere the next uh, when it turns winter. And it stays there for a long time. We can calculate how long it stays there. Our first calculation uh, showed that the uh, temperature would go down by you know, one one and a half degrees Celsius, about two degrees Fahrenheit. And the Swiss model showed similar results. The NCAR model had the smoke last longer. It calculated in more detail in the stratosphere, and actually it would last for a couple decades. So all right, so a couple degrees. What does that mean? So we said, let's take this, and let's go to places where they grow food and apply the change of temperature, the change of precipitation, the change of sunlight, and calculate how crops would grow. There would also be cooling in the ocean. Uh, oh, first of all, the ozone would be depleted. And so now we worry about the ozone hole around Antarctica. This would be a, a global ozone hole with excess ultraviolet. We haven't even had time yet to look at the impacts of the UV. So. This is a graph from our analysis using all of those three climate models, looking at how the production of the main food crops in China, the country that grows the most food, would change. And so this is for 10 years. And for rice, it would be down by 20%. For winter wheat, 40%. And this is only in the first decade. So let me summarize this in a table. In the US, 
corn would go down by 20%, soybeans 15%, rice would go down by 25% in China, wheat by 40%. This means the same amount of food that was uh, grown in China when they had several hundred million fewer people. And it would last for, for more than a decade. And so you can imagine people hoarding food, food, world food trade collapsing. And we're now analyzing every crop in every country so we can tell, go for the whole world and tell no more chocolate for you, no more wine for you. People can really ha have a gut feeling of how it's going to affect them, not somewhere else in the world. But it's, the story is much worse than that. Forget about what, it's much worse than that. Because as Ted mentioned, every trident has 100 nuclear weapons, and they're much more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. So each trident submarine can produce about 1,000 Hiroshimas, and the U.S. has 14 of them, and that's only half of our arsenal. And Russia's got the same size arsenal. So we could produce much, much, much more smoke if, if, if we used them. So we did a simulation of what would happen if the U.S. and Russia had a nuclear war. And a lot more smoke, it would go up in the atmosphere and cause much more temperature change. So now I'm going to graph the global temperature change. And the five teragram case I first showed you is up at the top here. And I've had to rescale the graph. So now for 150 million tons of smoke, 7 or 8 degrees Celsius colder, colder than the Little Ice Age. This is the same amount of smoke that we put in the atmosphere when we were studying nuclear winter in the 1980s using a third of the then much larger arsenals. And we were trying to figure out, how can you still get so much smoke? Well, it turns out with a third of the arsenal, every possible target in Russia and the US had nine nuclear bombs targeted on it. Because they, they put one on, OK, let's put two on in case it doesn't work. So this huge pile of weapons, OK, let's bounce the rubble. So now if we just put one on each target, we can still produce the same amount of smoke, even after the new START agreement is in effect. And so if you look at global warming, then <laughs> uh, this huge impact. Now, just before you ask, ask the question, yes, this would solve the global warming problem. <laughs> I did a calculation. If you put that much smoke in and you stop producing CO2, the global, global warming is gone. <laughs> I'm, I've re I'm writing an article about that called A Modest Proposal, A Solution to Global Warming. <laughs> so what's new in this work? A nuclear war between any nuclear states using much less than 1% of the current nuclear arsenal could produce climate change unprecedented in recorded human history. Such a, quote, small nuclear war could reduce food production by 20 to 40% for a decade. And we've repeated the nuclear winter calculations done in the 1980s about which there was some doubt about what do you really get temperatures below freezing. It turns out nuclear winter theory was correct. And the current arsenal, the Russian and American one, can still produce temperatures below freezing. And the effects would last for more than a decade. Now we have modern models that can heat the smoke taken in the upper atmosphere and calculate how long it would stay there. In the 1980s, the climate model simulations were done on a Cray-1 computer which is much less powerful than your iPhone in terms of its, its, its computing capability and its storage. So now we have modern computers that can do this uh, much better. Everything I've told you so far is theory. It's based on models, the same models we used to do weather prediction and climate model simulations. How do we test this theory? Uh, we don't really want to do it in the real world, so we use analogs. We use things that inform us about parts of the story. We know it gets cold in the winter, so why is it cold? Less light, less energy. The days are shorter, the sun's not as intense. So we have a feeling for how cold it can get. If you turn off the sun, we know it gets cold at nighttime. Unfortunately, we have examples of cities burning, both in San Francisco and during World War II, th with so-called conventional bombs, which makes it sound like it's OK. Uh, and we know, have examples from volcanoes and Martian dust storms of this dust and smoke being transported around the world and causing cooling. Now, what should we do about it? So President Obama and President Medvedev signed the New START Treaty in 2010. And that pledged that within seven years, each side would bring their nuclear warheads down to 1,550 per side. 
But strangely, each nuclear bomber counted as one nuclear weapon because they couldn't tell how many bombs there were inside of them. So maybe that means each country will still have about 2,000 nuclear weapons. So that's 4,000 nuclear warheads altogether, and maybe another 1,000 in the rest of the world. So what are the policy implications then? Immediate American and Russian reductions of the to the same arsenals of the other nuclear nations, about 200 each, would prevent nuclear winter. We wouldn't be able to produce enough smoke to actually cause temperatures to go below freezing and sentence the entire world to famine. But if we want to prevent the famine that would result, maybe uh, a billion people would die from a war between India and Pakistan because of the uh, cutting the food supply, then we have to get rid of all the nuclear weapons. Now, Carl Sagan, uh, who was one of the leaders about talking about this in the 1980s, said, for myself, I would far rather have a world in which the climatic catastrophe cannot happen, independent of the vicissitudes of leaders, institutions, and machines. This seems to me to be elementary planetary hygiene, as well as elementary patriotism. So elementary planetary hygiene demands that we eliminate the nuclear weapons much faster than they're being eliminated now. So how do you feel? I'm really sorry to, uh, to bum you out about this, to, to, to tell you about all this. I guess you paid to listen, though. Uh, so what can you do about it? Uh, now. Mark Twain said, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Uh, it feels good psychologically to pretend you didn't hear what I just said and go home and pretend it doesn't exist. And most of the world does that. Uh, Helen calls that psychic numbing. But another action is to try and do something about it to get rid of the weapons. So we've already banned biological weapons in the world, chemical weapons, landmines, and cluster mun munitions. But the worst nu uh, weapons of mass destruction of all, nuclear weapons, have not been banned. And so the ICANN, is, uh, the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, is working to actually ban nuclear weapons. So I'll, uh, Max mentioned Dr. Seuss. I'll just end with uh, another quote from Dr. Seuss. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alan. And I just was reminded of a show that 60 Minutes did some months ago with Leslie Stahl. And she visited the missile silos out in the Dakotas and Colorado, etc. Um, they're still using floppy disks to launch. Did you know that? Floppy disks. Um, not up to date computers. And often their telephones don't work. I was going to ask Leslie Stahl to come and speak, but I. She was unavailable. So um, a fascinating panel, and we're ready for questions. So if people have written their questions down on the pieces of paper, please hand them up here. And um, we'll have an interaction with the audience, if you're not too depressed to write. You know the stages of grief, shock and disbelief? followed by depression, followed by anger. It's the anger, angry phase that'll save the planet. And I know it's not appropriate in America to be angry, except if you just shoot people on the highway, but anger is a very elemental part of human survival, fight and flight. That's why we've got an adrenal uh, medulla, cortex. Where's, where's adrenaline produced? Medulla. What? in the medulla. Okay, let's... Yeah, um, we haven't got any questions in hand at the moment. Run them up, lovey, now. Then we can work on... This is for Ted Postel. 
You spoke of the catastrophic danger posed by the use of nuclear weapons, and I'd like to ask you what to do to avert this risk. Reagan's 1983 proposal for a strategic defence initiative was for cooperation with the USSR on new techniques to defend against missiles, including from other states. Didn't Dmitry Rogozin revived this in 2011 with his proposal for a strategic defense of Earth, including against asteroids. Your thoughts? Ted, and speak right into the mic with your mouth. <laughs> well, I, I don't know about defending the Earth. I mean, the <laughs> question is, who are we defending the, the Earth uh, from? Uh, maybe the people who are defending it. Um, the, the problem of strategic defense is is a very significant political problem. Uh, in fact, I'll be speaking in Washington in uh, three or four days uh, on, on this problem. Um, the Russians have made it very clear that there will be no future arms reductions if the United States continues to ignore their concerns about American missile defense programs. Now, we have a very uh, a seemingly um, contradictory situation because I would argue, and I think there are many, uh, I, I know many Russian scientists who, who, who would agree, that the current strategic defense capabilities essentially don't exist. They're, they're, they're a myth. Um, the, the real problem is that when you look at the strategic defense from the point of view of a potential adversary, you can't ignore them. Uh, I often give the experience, uh, to describe my own personal experience when I was working in the Pentagon as a scientific advisor for the Chief of Naval Operations. I was reviewing the situation with regard to the Russian uh, defense of, of Moscow. That's a completely different defense from the kinds of things we're talking about today. Nuclear armed interceptors and, uh, uh, you know, uh, multiple radars, things of that type. And it was very clear to me that this defense had essentially no capability. But my reaction, because technology by itself doesn't tell you the story, you have to think about the social and political implications of how technology interfaces with human society. Uh, my first reaction was, do these, do the Russia, does the Russian political leadership really think that this system has some capability? If you worked in the Pentagon as I did, you would be painfully aware that high-level decision makers often know less than a person who reads the newspaper carefully. And I, I don't mean this in a, in a in a pejorative way, it's just the way the structure of the organization is. And uh, so it's not impossible that political leaders at the highest levels actually don't know that uh, the uh, uh, strategic defense in Moscow doesn't work. You can't rule that out. So then I asked myself, well, what might they do if there were a crisis, if they believed that they had some defensive capabilities in this system? Could this alter their behavior? It's unknowable what could, what could happen, but uh, if it altered their behavior, could this precipitate a, a, a nuclear, nuclear strikes because of inadvertent, you know, inadvertent actions on one side or the other, uh, mistakes, you know, differences in perception? Anyone who looks at the, the circumstances that led up to World War I, you don't need to even do that. I mean, uh, leaders never, never, have the kind of information that people assume uh, that, they, that they would. And my, my, my joke with political scientists, American political scientists, is it's not a field, it's a joke, because they have all these games. They took game theory, rational. I said, it's, you can't have a rational game if you don't have the information in which to make uh, rational judgments. But uh, anyway, uh, I don't think defense is the answer, uh, both socially and politically. And technically, it's not feasible. So it's, it's a clean issue. It's not like uh, questions about global climate change, where there are all these subtleties, uh, which are all of which are important. But you know, uh, there are knowns and unknowns, things like that. It's, uh, it's really a very clear, clean-cut issue that defenses really have no constructive role to play. In fact, they're very dangerous. 
Thanks, Ted. Uh, I'd like to defend global warming theory. Uh, I, I, there's no question that humans are causing global warming. Uh, just wanted to add one thing <laughs> to uh, what you both said there. I, I think in short, the two things we should push for are those two knobs I had on my little cartoon. We should turn them both. We should take the X explosive power and by trying to reduce everybody to 200 warheads for a start. That would be great. That way, even if we screw up, at least there'll be less nuclear winter. And second, we should try to really turn down the P knob. And there will be a lot of discussions here at the meeting of how, what we can try to do to p push the superpowers from backing off from hair trigger alert, for example, which is, again, totally unnecessary for mutual assured destruction. And, and I, I, it's not mutual assured destruction, it's self-assured destruction. Yeah. If country A attacks country B and country B doesn't do anything, the climate change will kill everybody in country A. So you can't have a first strike against Russia and survive. So that's, that's something all people also don't realize. It's more mutually assured suicide. Sort of. Yeah. If, if you, if you uh, say, uh, I want to have nuclear deterrence, you're a suicide bomber. <laughs> Okay, um, people are using Twitter, use hash Caldecott Symposium. If you're using Twitter, hash Caldecott Symposium. Now this is for Max Tegmark. In view of AI systems taking over without human input, how dangerous and likely is the possibility of hackers taking control of the systems to launch nuclear war, or taking control of the decision to launch nuclear war? That's a good question. I, I think, uh, of course, it's very hard to say and make any realistic forecast about what happens if we get very advanced AI, human level or beyond, but we don't even have to talk about that to feel seriously worried. We just have to look at what we have now and what we're definitely going to have in, in the next few years. Just like you, Theodore, pointed out that we often greatly overestimate the knowledge that our leaders have in the political and military sphere, and just like we routinely overestimate their, uh, the rationality of, of the decisions that are made, uh, I think, speaking now as a, as a physics professor and technical person, I think we also greatly overestimate the robustness of the technical systems we build. The computer security we have generally is pathetic. Right? Look at what happens with billion dollar companies who really want to protect their intellectual property, how easily they fall prey to hacks done by very poorly funded groups. Right? It would be very naive to think today that the world nuclear systems are completely immune to any, any kind of hacking. It would be a big joke. And in, and. Um, I, I think it's something we should obviously worry about. And um, if we can't even produce, uh, I mean, even you know, I personally, I, I, and I feel I probably know more about computers than you know, your average US citizen. I, I really don't want my MIT computers to be hacked. So I put a lot of effort into security and use very, I don't <clears throat> basic Linux stuff, you know, turning all the fancy features off. Even Linux turned out to have this pathetic bug in it, the bash bug, you know. So, so um, it was just real. It, it, we have a very, very weak uh, computer security. And I think in, one of the things we really need to do, both to safeguard the nuclear programs and more generally to prepare for what's coming, where computers playing larger and larger roles in society, is to actually put much more research search into how we can actually tr make computers that we can trust. I don't think you'll ever be able to do that. No, but if, if we can't trust them, then we shouldn't put them in charge of respirators or, or other really life-critical systems, of well, course, why let alone nuclear, working, nuclear systems. Why are people working on AI then? Hmm? Why are people continuing to work on AI when people like you and Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking is so worried. Why are people continuing to work on it? It's valuable. Yeah, it's, it would be naive of us to think that the technological progress that people make huge amounts of money from is just going to stop. So it's like valuable that. in terms uh, of money. So, oh yes. So, so I think, I don't think it's realistic for us to think that AI development is suddenly going to stop. I, I think a more constructive way to think about this is we are witnessing a race. 
as with any technology, between on one hand the growing capability of AI, on the other hand the wisdom with which we use it and the robustness of the systems. And in fact, um, it's much easier, instead of trying to slow down technical progress where there's so much money to be made, it's much easier to try to accelerate the development of wisdom in the field because there's almost no money spent on that. That's why we launched this big program together with Elon Musk just last month to spend to really have, engage the smartest researchers in the field to think about not just how can they make um, AI systems that are more capable, but how can they make AI systems which actually do what you want them to do, that are robust and beneficial. And we're very happy with, with um, the response of this big push. We have uh, this grants competition where people around the world can compete for $10 million to start doing this. The deadline is actually on Sunday night. Uh, we have, uh, I just came back from the biggest annual AI conference of the year in Austin, Texas, the AAAI meeting, where for the first time they were openly discussing these issues in all sorts of ways. Stuart Russell, one of the grand um, old men of the field, gave a very passionate talk about how they need to redefine the whole goal of artificial intelligence from simply the goal of making intelligent machines to actually making intelligent machines that, do, that are beneficial for humanity. And I, I think that what we should really try to push for there in the short term is simply to establish this culture of social responsibility in that community. And I, I think uh, uh, that is something we are actually witnessing now gradually, which is a, a small step in the right direction. So I'll, I'll just interject. Um, I read recently that there are a thousand legitimate hackings into the Pentagon system per day. And I've uh, got a grandson aged 16 whose um, frontal lobe is not very well developed. And you wouldn't trust he and his mates at all to do anything. And they're often very intelligent, these kids. And is it possible, and I've asked another computer specialist this, could they develop a way to hack into the early warning system? Because they might think it's a hell of a hoot to you know, blow up the world at, at this age. They need a bit of stimulation. <laughs> what do you answer for that? I mean, I think the only responsible answer is that I don't have a clue. Yeah. Um, I think um, uh, people who operate these systems are really very cautious. I, I think it's a mistake to characterize the people who operate these systems, both on the American and the Russian side, and I've met people in both, uh, in, in both systems. Uh, they understand that anything that happens could result in the end of the world as we all know it. They do understand that. They also are soldiers, and their job is to provide military force should their leadership ask them to do that. So they have this tension in their responsibilities. But I think it is uh, not correct to think of them as just sort of sitting there eagerly waiting for their opportunity to press the button. I think uh, Mr. Petrov's heroic uh, uh, efforts are not unique. Uh, I don't mean, I'm not trying to diminish his contribution because he paid dearly for it. But uh, there are a lot of people in the system who really do care, who really worry uh, about this. Having said this, this in no way should make you more comfortable. I'm not assuring you, I want to be clear, I'm not assuring you that it can't happen. I'm just saying that uh, it's, it's a very complex question to make a judgment about. Would it be fair to say that Mr. Petrov's job no longer exists and has been replaced by a computer so that this information would automatically be relayed upwards to the highest command? Uh, it may be so, but um, I think there is a, a lot of automated stuff, but it ultimately goes to uh, human beings who have to make a judgment. So for example, this false alert in 1995, which I think was very serious, and, and, and just to be clear, at that time I had intelligence clearances, and I went into the Pentagon and Talk told... about the Norwegian rocket. The Norwegian rocket. I went into the Pentagon and explained to them what happened, because I reviewed the intelligence they had on it, and they had no intelligence. So the U.S. intelligence system had failed to analyze this and understand it. So I, can, I consider this very serious for many reasons. But uh, I also uh, know that, uh, as I've talked to Russians literally in the chain of command, that uh, they were, of course, 
obviously very concerned, and uh, but um, but nobody was rushing uh, to to launch uh, forces. And um, uh, I'm sure. In fact, I speculated on this, and they they later confirmed this, that when the Norwegian rocket was first observed, it fit a certain pattern, which I could we analyzed in detail, but we need not worry about for here, uh, that set off an automated alert. I'm sure there was a routine in the computer monitoring system, set off an automated alert. I wouldn't be surprised if the people at the radar at Olenogorsk didn't even know the automated alert went off, but the people in Moscow did. Uh, but the data would have been presented to them um, they uh, would have uh, considered the situation. And of course, the great danger was they couldn't look at the early warning satellite data, because they had none. And um, of course, the other danger is that people think they can fight and win nuclear wars. So it's a very complicated uh, set of issues here. But uh, I, don't think, um, I, I don't think we should, uh, we should think of these people as just nuts to tr trying to look for an opportunity. Right. Yeah, but it's but not I'm not arguing it isn't a great danger. I mean, this, I've spent a large part of my life worrying about it. What about the fact that over 70 missile officers over the last year and their commanders-in-chief, two of them, have been fired because they've been inappropriate in Moscow or they've been taking drugs or they've been cheating or go to sleep on the job? Um, and it's not very sexy now to sit at a missile um, bank and decide whether or not to blow up the planet. What about that, human fallibility? I, sorry. Uh, I think maintaining uh, a, a high quality manning of our nuclear forces, particularly American nuclear forces, is a tremendous problem that they will not be able to solve. It's a dead end for your career as a military officer. If you're a military officer and you're bright and you're ambitious, you don't want to go and sit in an underground silo. So, uh, so they, don't get the high, say, they don't get the highest quality people. I, I don't mean to this in a pejorative way for these people. I think they're very dedicated. But uh, they don't get the kind of talent that they've gotten in the past because people in the past have felt that they were doing something in the nation's best interest. And now, these people feel like they're in a back uh, in, in the backwoods, and you know, just like any professional area, these pe people who have more mobility choose different positions. And I think these forces are horrendously more dangerous than they were earlier, when they were very dangerous then. So I think yeah. so. It's it's a real problem. I think to, just to summarize this important question, I mean, it, it's obvious that the status quo is untenable in the long term. It's just this incredibly complicated system, and once in a while some really unusual sequence of events comes together and something bad happens. That was, of course, the premise of Dr. Strangelove, as we heard about. Just make the analogy with people in this country. You know, every week, people accidentally shoot their five-year-old daughter because they think it's a burglar or something like that. These are not people who want to do that. They often have a lot of safeguards, but there's some really weird... If you have a lot of people, a lot of incidents once in a while, a really unfortunate situation happens. And uh, um, the only responsible thing to do for us as a species is to change the status quo and uh, really reduce the power of our arsenals and, and reduce this probability. Thank you. Um, a question for Alan Robock. For comparison, how many Hiroshima-sized detonations would begin the global climate, would start the global climate impact? We did a simulation of 100 Hiroshima-sized weapons, which would be about half of the current arsenals of India and Pakistan. And we calculated what the climate response would be. We also did, we, we were sort of concerned, we put 5 million tons of smoke in the atmosphere. We also did a calculation of 1 million tons of smoke, of 20% of that, and we got about 20% of the climate response. If you start putting a lot more, it's not linear. The more smoke doesn't, doesn't the climate response doesn't increase proportionally because once you block out a certain amount of sun, you put more smoke up there, there's not any sun left to, to block out. 
people have asked me, you know, so, okay, so can we fight a war with 17 and not worry about climate change? Uh, uh, well, how many do we, so we haven't done that calculation. If you want to do uh, more, more, very small numbers, then you have to know what the weather is that day, what the specific target is, uh, whether the wind is blowing, whether the, we assume the area in the city would burn, would be the same as what burned in Hiroshima, because that's the only example we have. The Nagasaki bomb was in a valley, so less of it burned. But if there was a wind blowing and it propagated through a much larger city, you could get a lot more smoke just from one bomb. So we don't, uh, we haven't done that analysis. Uh, the other thing is, it's very hard to imagine a situation where only a few nuclear weapons would be used and it wouldn't, it wouldn't escalate. Uh, once, once somebody's attacked. Uh, the tendency is to retaliate, to, to you lose communication, you panic, and I don't know of any sort of, it's, it's not rational to use nuclear weapons in the first place, but I don't know of any other rational scenarios where you can have limited nuclear war and only use a few and then not have it propagate. So, uh, it, indeed, if, if there was one terrorist attack on a city of the United States, it would be a terrible tragedy, but it wouldn't produce global climate change. So there's a uh, certain amount of smoke goes up, uh, produ produces more climate change. So uh, we, we haven't answered that question, but I don't think it's a, it, it's, it, it's a scenario people should plan for. Thank you. This is an important one, and I'll throw it open to the panel, but I also probably should answer it as a physician. Musk, Hawking, et al. claim that the future of life depends on colonizing space. But does that promote abandoning stewardship of Earth in future generations um, in a self-fulfilling prophecy? How can we promote a cosmic perspective of life in the universe? Who wants to go? Can I comment on that? Let me just say one thing. Uh, you know, Carl Sagan spent a lot of his life uh, trying to figure out whether there life in outer space, and the answer is as Max said, there's no evidence yet of it. And there's this Drake equation, which multiplies the pro number of stars times the number of planets times the probability that they develop technology and so forth. And Carl thought maybe, you know, there have been technology that developed in the, in the past, but once they get to the point of being able to build nuclear weapons, they pretty soon destroy themselves, and we don't hear from them again. So uh, uh, you can't, we don't have any data on that, but but uh, we know that we could do it ourselves, and so I would, I would rather spend a lot more effort trying to fix things here than, than uh, send a few people into in outer space. That just doesn't seem like a rational way to uh, solve, <laughs> solve the problem. Let me add to that, and, and uh, just so it liven things up so you don't feel that we necessarily agree on absolutely everything here on the panel also. Uh, the devil's advocate point of view would be that if we've made a backup of our biosphere by having some people on another planet, we would be more reckless about this one. In my personal experience, talking with astronauts whom I know, it's exactly the opposite. Everybody I know who has actually been at the International Space Station, for instance, has felt not, oh wow, I have a backup. I don't worry about Earth now anymore, uh, but rather, really just, it's, uh, they described it to me as a profoundly life-changing experience where when they look down at Earth, this fragile little planet and this stark inhospitable space, they really, really start thinking global, thinking that, wow, I, we really need to be good stewards of this amazing planet that we have. And to me, the much more powerful effect is that we, if you get people even thinking about space in the first place, even thinking about the long-term future of humanity, even thinking about the future of life beyond the next election cycle, that already will, will reduce the risk of, of voting for politicians who do really stupid things here on Earth. And <clears throat> so I'm all for encouraging people to think big and also think about the long-term future. In terms of money, it's also important to remember that the, the amount of money we actually spend on science, <laughs> the amount of money Elon Musk spends trying to plan for a Mars program, etc., is absolutely puny compared to how much money we spend on, on building this the system for destroying life on Earth with nukes. Now, the entire, the entire funding for all of mathematics and physics in the United States in a year from the National Science Foundation is about $2 million. It's about the same as the military spends in a day, in one day, okay? So don't come and tell me that, oh, by, by 
cutting the science visionaries a little bit, somehow we're going to that's going to somehow make some life so much better. Let's just cut, if you cut the military by a third of a percent, it would have the same, the same effect. We shouldn't take the various idealists and try to pit them against each other by saying, you know, no, the idealists who want to stop nuclear war should duke it out against the idealists who want life to flourish in space and fight over the pennies when there are such enormous amounts of resources instead spending on, being spent on our nuclear weapons program and, and other things. That's my two cents. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, but I agree with you. <laughs> um, I'll speak as a physician now. Humans cannot survive in space. Um, if they're up in space without gravity for too long, their, their muscles turn to tissue paper, their tendons uh, split and, and fall apart, the bones demineralize, they can become psychotic with loneliness, uh, their blood pressure falls. Um, humans cannot cannot exist in space without gravity. So let's wipe out the whole notion of going to other planets and spending any money on that at all. Let's fix this planet. Um, Ted Postel, does Russia actually have a dead hand system that would respond to a nuclear attack if its command and control system were destroyed and if Moscow was decapitated? Well, I think, again, this is one of those uh, questions where I have to answer, I have no idea. But let me explain to you why I think there may be something like this, although I'm only speculating. Uh, the, we know for a fact, I wanna, we do know for a fact that the Russian leadership does believe that it, there could be an attempt to decapitate leadership in Moscow. We Describe what decapitation means. Uh, basically that uh, the United States as part of an attack against Russia would, would aim at destroying uh, the political leadership of, uh, of Russia. The, the idea, again, thinking again of conventionalizing nuclear war uh, with conventional objectives as if that's possible. Uh, you destroy the leadership, the command structure breaks down, the command structure breaks down, they, can't, they, they, they may not be able to respond to your attack, you may be able to destroy lots of forces before anything happens in return. So you, so you want to destroy the leadership within this bizarre framework of thinking. And, but they are, they are acutely aware of it, that I can say for sure. I've had many private discussions with uh, Russian uh, people in leadership roles. Um, because of that, uh, and because of the short time they have, because they're limited to only radar early warning, they don't have space-based early warning, um, there are probably, in fact, I'm, I can't say for sure, but I'm almost certain <coughs> that there are uh, what, what, somewhat, what, what's, what might be called pre-delegated situations. So you're manning the nuclear forces, I'm not sure I'm going to be here to execute or to give you an order. So I say, if A, B, C, and D happens, you're on your own. You can, you can launch the forces. So I pre-delegate uh, decision-making. Oh, to some gentle one-star uh, uh, office, one-star general who, who thinks that the Americans ought to be destroyed. You know, well, <laughs> Valery Yaronich, you know, Valery Yaronich, Valery Yaronich, the Russian scientist, developed the dead hand system, and he wrote a book about it, and I got to know Valerie, Valerie wo very well, and they've dug a huge cave in the Ural Mountains, and they have this rocket, which can be sent up if Moscow is decapitated, which sends a signal to all their missiles to be launched before America kills yeah. their missiles. Yeah, but we, we have, we had similar things. We, we had IRCS. Oh? Ir you know what IRCS? Emergency rocket communication system, <laughs> where we were going to launch. I mean, these are uh, these are there are a variety of provisions to assure that forces could be launched. The problem that is most serious is, is that, in fact, is strongly related to the artificial intelligence problem that's been raised. Is that you you have to set up protocols if you believe that you have to respond. Yeah. I'm sorry. If you believe you have to respond you uh, then you must set up protocols for the launch of the forces if you're not going to be in a position to order it if you did 
I, I'm not arguing for this. I'm just saying this is uh, if you mm -hmm. have this belief system. And it would be the height of recklessness to assume that the Russians haven't made some kinds of provisions, probably with a lot of checks and balances in them. But as we know, um, complex situations have uh, failure modes that we, we can't know about. That's every, when you get your blue screen or whatever else. Well, we know that in medicine too. Yeah. We sometimes... So I, I would say it, it might, might not be, it might not be as, it might in essence be a dead hand system, but it might not be as simple as people picture it to be. Okay. Um, and we may, we may have something similar. You know, we, we pre-delegated authority to a strategic air command one-star general <coughs> flying over the ICBM fields under certain conditions during the Cold War. So we had a similar system. Yeah, I'll just bring up this point that during the Cold War, planes were always in the air, American planes armed with nuclear weapons ready to go over to Russia to bomb them if they got the message. And the pilots had to wear a patch over one eye because when they blew up their bomb, they would be blinded so that they could take the patch off after the explosions and be able to fly home, except when they flew home there would be no airports to land in because they would all be destroyed. Furthermore, as we know from uh, Alan Robach's work with volcanoes and the like, planes cannot fly through volcanic ash and dust because it gets sucked into the jet engine and they crash, nor can they fly after a nuclear war because of all the smoke and ash. Just thought I'd include that. That was all planned. I was involved in, with anti-nuclear activism before and after June 12, 1982. Activism dropped after the march as though we'd won. What's happened to activism? Why? How do we move forward? There you are. Go for it. Uh, first, I want to compliment you on doing one of the things which is incredibly powerful which is simply bringing new explosive facts to the table. I think that anybody who is a scientist or, or, or has knowledge which can be used to better make the case, you know, should really never underestimate how much power that might have. You know, the, 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 the insights that nuclear winter was as terrible as it was, you know, wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for scientists like, like yourself. And I think if everybody on the planet was as informed about what we already know as you in this room are, we wouldn't be in this bad situation either. But how do we get people to pay attention when they have more immediate concerns with life, they think the Cold War is over, they don't have to worry about it, and they think the possibility is remote or they just don't know about it. How do you... I, I, so, one, one day I got an email, uh, the Cubans would like you to come to uh, talk about nuclear winter, and I, and I went down there, they paid for it, and Fidel Castro walked into the room and sat there and listened to my hour-long talk, and after, he said, can we televise it? And I said, yes, and uh, next day I was walking around Havana, and we went into, uh, in prime time, it was on national television, I went into a bar, where, uh, a hotel where there was a, a TV, and there was a Julia Roberts movie on the TV, and I asked the bartender, could you change the channel? And sure enough, there I was giving my lecture. So what that taught me is we need a movie with Julia Roberts, not a professor giving a lecture to get people's attention. We need to get it into the... We need this, uh, this movie with a beautiful Russian scientist who falls in love with an American scientist, and there were trying to warn the world and, and there's, there's of course some sex in there and then, and then along the Kashmiri border and you can imagine sort of making a real thriller to inform people but if, so if any, if any screenwriters out there I think that's the way to get people involved not, not these sort of dry uh, scientific lectures. Well the media is determining the fate of the earth. I, I'm the sorry. Media, the media is determining the fate of the earth including Rupert Murdoch who is an Australian and who created my career back in 71 when I lobbied I'm, I'm against... Sorry, I'm sorry to tell you this, Alan, but you're not as good looking as Julia Roberts. No, <laughs> Wait a minute, you've got to listen to me. No, the the, the yeah. media is determining let, the fate of the earth. Let, let, I, and I, if the oh. average Joe Sixpack doesn't understand what we're talking about today, 
And if they just put these three speakers on television, on Stuart and Ma and Colbert and 60 Minutes and all the rest, Fox, the average Joe Sixpack and Mrs. Joe Sixpack would understand the population would rise up to abolish nuclear weapons. That's the only, only way we can do it. So these people have to be on television. And if, to get on television, you go to the top producer, you go to the director, always go to the top. And we've got to be aggressive and uh, demand that they put these people on, otherwise we're doomed. Well, uh, well someone Please comment. some friends of mine have suggested that there be a movie about my work, but I told them Jonathan Winters was already dead, so he couldn't play me. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, I think that we do have uh, a very serious chicken and egg problem. And um, I don't like to sound like, a, like I'm using simple-minded rhetoric, but if you go to Washington and you move in the inner circles of Washington, and uh, I, they occasionally let me in, uh, not often, but uh, what one is struck by is what a bubble the place is and what an echo chamber it is. Speak more into the mic. And what, what, what one is struck by is what a bubble the place is and what an echo chamber it is. And, and people it's like people who pick up a telephone and they always hear a, uh, a dial tone and they think that everything naturally works. I always explain, you know, that's not the natural world. Usually you pick up the telephone in the real world and nothing's happening. And, uh, and uh, you have a group of people who think they know a lot more than they do. And anybody who raises a question about that is naive because you're, you don't understand the world the way they do. And, and it's extremely difficult at this time to get anybody in a leadership position to acknowledge anything of substance and have a substantive discussion with them. And uh, it's, uh, I'm not a sociologist, but I think some good sociology would be a very interesting thing to apply to this problem because I don't, I, I, I experience it, but I don't quite understand its sources. But if something is not done to alter this situation, we're in trouble for so many reasons that it's hard to believe. So, so there's a problem of leadership here. So, I have a question for all of you, yeah. which is a follow-up to Helen's question, actually. I, I think that, um, I completely agree with you. <laughs> Julia Roberts <laughs> looks a lot better than, than we do. And, and, uh, but I, there are a lot of, a small fraction perhaps, but there are a significant number of even very famous actors who really care a lot about this. Morgan Freeman is even part of our organization. And I, my question for all of you is we have a lot of people in this room you guys, you, we have Union of Concerned Scientists, Federation of American Scientists, Bulletin of American Scientists, and Center for Global Catastrophic Risk, and many, many others, I'm not going to list you all, who have thought a lot about specific things we can push for, specific battles we can pick. And um, if we, what is the single lowest hanging fruit, the one first battle that we would like to try to rally Whenever we get an opportunity to get one of these actors to really help us out or to get a really big media splash, what is the first thing, the lowest hanging fruit? It's not abolish all nuclear weapons because that's higher up in the fruit tree, right? What is the first thing? Yeah, do, do you alert? Do you Hair alert? trigger alert. But if, suppose you do. What, what, is the, what is the particular battle we should pick first? No, but I mean, what policy goal? Huh? Yeah, take, take the weapons off high alert. Uh, U.S. unilaterally take the weapons you know, off high alert. Yeah, I, I, I talked to Rose Gottmiller a year ago, who's President Obama's nuclear advisor. I said, why can't Obama just reduce the U.S. nuclear arsenal? We don't need an agreement with Russia to do that. How can we, how can we want, tell Iran not to make weapons when we keep ours? It's like you're sitting in a bar telling people not to drink. Why don't you set an example and make, oh no, we can't do that, we can't, she didn't, didn't understand the concept. We can't do that, we need to do it, we need to be verifiable. We, I said, but George H.W. Bush did it. Oh, that was different, that was different. So it's really hard to get these people to even understand this concept. But uh, the first thing is just to, to uh, yeah, m make the world safer uh, so, that, so that these accidents can't, are much harder to happen. 
Okay, with this enigma, yeah, I have a comment here. we are now dis Oh, do you want one more? Yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, I myself am not a fan of de-alerting because there are lots of issues around uh, what you're actually doing. I mean, uh, how do I know it's de-alerted? But I do think uh, Alan is right. <clears throat> there are things that can be done. Uh, the United States could just decide, the president could, well, I, I think the political system won't let them, to be frank, but, but we could just declare that we are dis dissembling our uh, ICBM force. We would still have a lot of strike capability, more than we need, and still be dangerous. We could lower the alert rates of submarines, and um, that would be a signal. Now, what happened under George H.W. Bush is he just unilaterally said, we are not going to put nuclear-armed cruise missiles on ships and attack submarines. And Gorbachev responded in kind. So I don't, uh, you know, if you have some leadership, you can do things, substantive things. OK, OK, no, I'll <laughs> this is the last comment before morning tea. Speak loudly, Bob. Okay, look, we've got to end now because time is short. I want to make another announcement. All have a lovely morning, and, uh, morning tea and coffee, but we're playing a film on the beach at 4 o'clock. I don't want any of you to leave. I'm going to lock the doors, <laughs> even if you have to go to the bathroom, because we can talk about nuclear weapons till the cows come home, numbers, technologies, but I want you to feel it in your gut. And that's a film that turned me on when I was 17. It was set in my hometown, Melbourne, and everyone died except people in Melbourne. And then everyone did die. So I want you to You're feel this it. very ordinary, ordinary people <laughs> facing <laughs> extinction. I want you to feel it and understand emotionally in your right brain and your midbrain and maybe your, your uh, your basal gang, no, anyway. So understand what this is about, and it's not just about numbers, figures, and technology. It's about us and our passions. So we'll see you back here at 11.50.